so Marcelo, um, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for helping us to have a better understanding of this uh, new ISO 14971. Um, can you just make an introduction of yourself so that people are, are knowing you? Um, and as I've said uh, on previously, I just showed that you were participating to one of the, the podcast episodes, one of the first ones, the episode 12. <laughs> we are now at episode 62. Uh, so yeah, so it was really uh, a long time ago. And uh, yeah, can you just introduce yourself and then we can uh, kick off with this presentation? Sure, thank you. Uh, so my name is Marcelo. I work with SQR Consulting. I work as a regulatory strategy uh, sorry, regulatory affairs strategy consultant for medical devices. Our focus is only on medical devices. And besides working with uh, consultant as a consultant, I also participate in several uh, different initiatives related to medical device. Uh, one of them is I chair the Brazilian group on uh, which is a mirror of ISO TC210, and ISO TC210 is the ISO working group that deals with topics such as quality management systems, risk management, software usability, and others. Uh, I also chair the Brazilian committee uh, related to ISO TC194, which deals with medical device biological safety and medical device clinical evaluation and investigations. So uh, I do participate, I, I do other stuff. I, I do, I'm a teacher of, of several courses in some universities in Brazil. I do give a lot of training also. Uh, and uh, I think that's it. Well, there's a number of things that I do, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's great. So thank you, thank you for that. I don't remember how many different stuff I do. Yeah, one of the things that, I think one, one of the things I just use I think it's important to mention that we are always working together with uh, manufacturers, in particular associations of manufacturers in Brazil, and several times we do represent them uh, in discussions, including international discussions. For example, I represented the Brazilian industry on the IMDRF uh, Software as Medical Device Working Group. Uh, a lot of times I'm, I'm, I'm called by Envisa or Inmetro to, to be an, ex, uh, an expert witness and discussion on some topics. I also participate in metro certifications, regulations, creation groups. So uh, I'm trying to be involved in several of those things related to medical devices in Brazil and worldwide. No, great. So you are calling now from Brazil. I am from Brazil, yeah. Yeah, I just see on the comments, uh, Patricia, Ellen, Nakano, who says, uh, Marcelo Antunes is a reference in Brazil. And yes, I confirm. <laughs> it's why I'm really connected with him, because uh, I know that uh, he was really uh, helpful and supportive in all uh, the questions related to um, to this, to the standards, and also to Brazilian things. Um, <clears throat> Marcelo, you also have a, a website where you are trying to inform about all the changes, the updates. Uh, related to medical devices, and you are trying to provide uh, all the information that are going one by one. What is the name of the website again? It's medicaldevice.expert. Okay, medicaldevice.expert. So I will try to, uh, to put that on the show notes for people yeah. if they want to go and to check. Uh, uh, um, I can say it's a feed of all the changes that are happening in the in the regulations. Okay, so let's not <laughs> wait more. Just a comment. In fact, I created this website because I was having trouble tracking information for myself. So I do this for me, but obviously it will help others with for information. Yeah. It's always like that. We are we don't find the information ourselves, so we create it and then we I hope we hope it helps uh, the others. Yeah. Um okay, Marcelo. So let's kick off with the presentation. So you sent me a presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so can we can we uh, offer this presentation for download after the session? Sure, no problem. Yeah. Okay, so let's do it now. Um, okay, here it is. Presentation. Okay, we are there. So I just customized it a bit to put um, pictures of uh, today's uh, episode. So Marcelo, um, I will run the, the presentation. So I let you speak. And if I have any question or if I see any question from the audience, I will just uh, try to mention that to you. So if you have any question about what Marcelo is saying, just write it on the on the um, on the comments. 
Uh, I will try uh, to um, to say that to Marcelo, but there is always a delay between the time I'm, we are presenting and the time we are receiving the information. So maybe we will receive the comments a bit later. So, but we will try to to uh, to inform about that to you. Um, okay, so let's go on. So Marcelo, your turn. So what are we presenting today? Yeah, uh, but what we are presenting mainly the changes uh, on the new standard on the body of the standard we on the requirements basically so the way i am doing this and i did this sometimes in brazil is to focus on the re new requirements with some explanation of the new requirements so the standards has some new stuff for example there are some new terms and definitions i'm not going into that right they, it has re some revises and access, but main, most of the annexes was transferred to ISO TR 24971. So the idea on this presentation, and I think it's the, the best way to show these changes, is to focus on certain parts of the text of the standards and how they were was changed. They were changed, and then I can I will I will discuss a little background on these changes. Good. So let's try to do that. So we start with uh, <coughs> introduction. Yeah. So the new uh, ISO 14971 was published in 2000 in uh, December last year. In fact, there was an, an anecdote here. It was published erroneously at the time because it was uh, requested to be published together with a Yen version, the European version, because the standard is under what we call the Vienna Agreement. So there is a parallel voting on uh, uh, stand. Uh, but for some reason, ISO published it one week earlier. So okay. <laughs> it was born prematurely. Uh, this standard it, it is created by this working group, ISO TC210, which is one of the ISO technical committees that deal with standards, and joint working group one, which is a work working group from ISO TC210, but it's also a joint work with ISO 62A, which is the working group in IEC that develops 60601, the, the, the general standard and uh, collateral standard. So historically, this group was created to be a joint working group. Okay. Uh, so why do we need to revise this standard? Well, in fact, we don't need to revise. The fact is we have uh, any ISO deliverable meaning it a standard, a technical report, or a technical specification, uh, they have, when they are published, they have set what we call a systematic review period. So uh, this is usually five years, in fact, the, the fall is five years. So it means that each five years, and, and basically we do that one year previously, right? Uh, we have to decide, and we call, we, we are, I'm talking in this case, the national committees that are part of ISO, NIC in this case, they have to vote on what to do with the standard. And basically the output is we maintain the standard, we confirm the standard, we confirm the standard. We don't use reconfirm in ISO, but for example, what NC in the US use the term reconfirm and things like that. Yeah, this is the same, we don't change the standard, just say it's valid for some more time, right? Either we uh, confirm, reconfirm the standard or we uh, withdraw the standard, we can conclude the standard is not uh, meeting its objectives anymore, or we can amend or revise the standard. There are some other outputs, but they're many more technical. So basically for, for lay people, for people that work in that, the easiest way to understand there, we do reconfirm, withdraw, or revise or amend, right? Yeah. ISO, yeah, ISO 1335 2003, which was the old version, it was reconfirmed uh, in the past. Uh, in fact, one of the reconfirmations were, were we created ISO uh, tr uh, TR 24971 because in one of the reconfirmation uh, uh, years, a comment, sorry, one of some national committee asked some question about some topics. 
So instead of revising the standard, we decide to create a technical report to answer those topics. That's how ISO TR24971 was born initially. In fact, the name of the of the document is a little misleading because it's not a guide on ISO 14971. In fact, it's the guide on five questions that need to be answered on 14971. Right? Okay. <laughs> uh, so this idea of systematic review is to keep standards uh, uh, up to date. Right. So if you think about today, we have new regulations, new standards, new developments on the medical device field. So usually we need to see what we need to do. So last time, the, the last time that the systematic review was out, uh, it was a discussion that we need to revise the standard. So that was the conclusion, right? So uh, we could have a new reconfirmation. It would be five more years. So it was understood in particular because of the, uh, just to make it clear, uh, this, discussion that I'm saying that the, 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 the systematic review were four years ago, right? Yeah. So we were in uh, expecting the publication of the UMDR, right? There yeah. were several other discussions during that time. So it was felt that there was a need to change the standard to at least adapt some of the things, revise some small things, but also adapt some of the things for the new expectation that was being created at the time. So basically, nice. yeah, basically, this is a general overview on the need to revise this standard. Yeah, and um, we suppose that maybe to be um, redecided again in 2024, around this time, to see if we are uh, going uh, reconfirming or not the standard. The, 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 the next systematic review is for 2024. Okay, good. Okay. Um, Let me uh, just, just remember to say one thing. Yeah. It's important that you understand that we, in practice, decide not to change the standard, meaning uh, it was understood that the process that the standard required was good, right? So we have a decision, although we don't have these decisions, we can change the whole standard if we want to. There was a consensus, there was an agreement that we would not change the standard itself. It would basically correct some things and adapt some things to our new uh, new world, let's say, but without digging too much into the uh, process itself, because the process defined by the requirements of ISO 14971 are understood to be a very good process related to medical device risk management. Okay. No, I think it's um, it's uh, completely understandable for for people um, that uh, yeah this is one of the major um, one if I can say for for the standard. Um, well, one of the problems that we should change it everything will be will be that people had would have to change everything. So the main yeah. point is that this standard is used as a basis, right? It's basically one of the most important standard together with 1335 that uses as a basis for regulations and does for the compliance of regulations by manufacturers. Any change on this plan that have to be carefully uh, analyzed to verify the possible outcomes and what how the changes will impact the industry and other players. So yeah, that, I think it's, it's the it's the annoying part where where we are when we are changing those standards. It's like we have to change a lot of documentation. So let's let's not make a full change of everything uh, for for them. So to make less spend as possible. But uh, but I think it's a great. Um, okay, so here we have the main changes. We have the process that you defined in terms of stages. Actually, we have the international standard published, and then we have the different other stages that are um, confirmed with, um, with the change for the standard. Um, when, so as of now, we have the standard that is published, December mm -hmm. 2019. Um, when we can say that it's kind of, we have a kind of a transition period. So by when we can say that now you have to apply this standard for sure. You can't, and that's one confusion that people have. Uh, ISO publishes standards. In uh, When ISO publishes standards, a standard is voluntary. Any standards 
publisher in the world by any SEOs, which are standards development organizations, they are voluntary. You use the standard if you want, basically because standards are one uh, possible solution to problems or requirements or whatever. So uh, there's no transition period for a standard from the standpoint of ISO because ISO does not enforce any standard. What we usually do, and that's we do in requests, because requests for stakeholders to say, oh, this standard, if you want to use it or are using it uh, and want to use the new version, maybe two, three, four, five years is good enough. Uh, sometimes <laughs> we put this, in fact, the ISO does not put this in any, all standard, in every standard. Uh, but the fact is, even if we put this in the standard, it means nothing because the standard is not mandatory. What defines the regulatory use of the standard is the regulatory requirements that you have to comply with. Basically, the regulatory requirements of each country. So, um, actually, we have just the ISO. Um, then now we are waiting for the EN ISO and or BS ISO or other things. So are they already published? Yes, EN ISO has been published one week after yeah. the ISO version. And that's what I said. They, they were going to be published together. And that's the error I mentioned that it was born prematurely. OK. Um, so OK, great. So I think we have uh, clear information now about uh, the ISO, the, 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 the way that it's um, it's done. Let's go now to the changes. So yeah, we just, have... Just so one small comment on the previous slide. Just yeah. right here. For, in fact, it just showed that uh, the standard, so you can see that we started in 2016, right? The revision process, yeah. it was approved on, on uh, November 2016. And we finished that in uh, December 2019. This is this is not common because most of the time we the, the usual uh, uh, time for this revisions or any revision on any standard creation is five years, even okay. more. Right? So we it's interesting to know uh, that we did a very good let's say, but a very quick job because we basically had twice the number of meetings we always have per year, but to be able to finish the standard. There was another reason. This was a request, in fact, from one of our parent committees, uh, the ISO part, because they are publishing the amendment to 60601, the second amendment, and uh, they needed uh, the ISO standard to finish it before this publication. So the amendment can use the revised ISO standard as a basis. Okay, so I think it's great to have all the behind the scene story for those uh, those kind of uh, of uh, standard. Um, okay, so let's go now to the changes as we said. So first changes. So the first change that we had, and, and it's important to understand that I mentioned that most of these changes are uh, not real, let's say, impactful changes. If, if you had already applied the idea of the requirement, the problem is some requirements were not exactly clear on what uh, they, they wanted. They sometimes used statements or terms that were not the most correct ones. So, for example, this first one, it changes the policy. Uh, in the case of management responsibility, it says that the policy shall provide a framework that ensures that criteria are based upon regulation standards and whatever. So there's a little uh, another text with that. This is not really a real change, but the thing is in the past, it did, did make it clear that the policy we needed to be used as the basis for the criteria. And it's very common that we see uh, implementations of 14971 that have a, a policy, a risk management policy, and then they do not use the policy as a framework for the criteria. So in this specific case, we are trying to make it more clear that they have to be linked. In fact, the criteria has to be based on the policy. Okay. Um, we have just one question now. I don't know if it's related to that, but uh, let's ask it. Um, according to the MDR state-of-the-art requirements, should we apply the new version of ISO 4971 to meet the MDR requirements? 
Yeah, and th this is what I said re related to uh, when or how we need to apply the standards. Uh, the problem is you can, for in, the, in Europe, including the MDR and the directives, uh, standards are voluntary. They are always voluntary. So you can use any standard you want. I usually say in my training that you can use the piece of paper that you found on the floor to do anything. It's accepted by European regulations. The only problem is that as you have to comply with legal requirements, which as we are what are in the regulations or the directives, uh, if you use a solution that is not in a harmonized standard, and then we have the, 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 the reharmonization process, you do not gain what is called presumption of conformity. So the idea is if you use the requirements of a standard, he's harmonized with the requirements of the legal requirements of the directors, for example, or the regulation, you are deemed to be compliant with the requirements of the regulation. If you don't use a harmonized standard, you can use any standard, anything, whatever you want to use. You do not gain presumption of conformity. So you have to prove, let's say, in more in depth, how, why your solution complies with the requirement, the legal requirement. Yeah, so it means, it means that if you have the harmonized standard, if you are following that, they will not look really how you uh, have used it because it's an harmonized standard, so it's something that everybody recognizes. Yeah, they, can, yeah, they can do that because there is a legal, a legal provision that say that if you use the harmonized standard, it, it, just to make it clear, it's not the standard itself, or right? it's the requirements for the standards are harmonized, right? Because uh, th there's a lot of standards that are not harmonized fully. They are only harmonized for some specific requirements. So these requirements are harmonized uh, for some requirements in the regulations, for example. Uh, the standards need, not all of them have, but they uh, harmonize the standards need to have an annex, an XZA, right, which says how they are harmonized. And then you gain, if you use the standard in this, with this harmonized requirements from the standard, you are deemed to be in compliance, automatically be in compliance with the legal requirements they are harmonized to. So it's it's why it's why they are we are using really harmonized standard because it's easier for us as soon as we yeah. comply to them. It's really easier. We don't have to go more further in terms of explanation or deep dive. We are using the standard so understood by everybody and everybody will recognize yeah, that. So it's fine. more to that. We can also discuss sometimes the, the reason from how how the the European system was created. I think it's important. People uh, sometimes do not know that there's a lot of reasons for that. But one of the main reasons is what you said. So if you, the manufacturer uses a harmonized standard, it makes it easier for the conformity uh, assessment process, which is what we have to pass, to be uh, shown uh, that they are compliant. OK, yeah. so I hope, this, I hope this answers the question of Sylvia Liu. So thank you, Sylvia. Uh, if you yes. have more questions, so uh, let's, uh, let's look at that. But let's maybe continue on the presentation. Sure. Well, just one last comment is that yeah. It is the problem with the question. In fact, the MDR does not have a list of harmonizing standards yet. Yeah. In fact, even the draft does not finish it yet. So the main fact is you can use any standard to fulfill the MDR. The problem is you want to join prisms of conformity. So they can look for more information to be really sure that you are. I mean, they they are they have the right to do that. But yeah. I suppose if you are using the ISO 14971, even if it's not harmonized, I'm really sure that they are not really going to, to do that because mainly they know that. Yeah, that's the yeah, exactly. if, it's okay. a new standard, if it's a new standard, it's probably okay to use that. That's the yeah. One thing, so we see here the ISO TR 24971. Um, it's a guidance. Yeah. Um, it's not published. Not yet. This is a problem again of the background. We created both both documents together, but we did create 1471 first. So uh, the text of 1471 was finished uh, at the end at the end of the first semester of last year. So it was really everything was done in practice. Uh, ICTR 24971. We were still working with it in December. <laughs> we did work with it in our London meeting in October. 
and we have some things to do in December. After December, there was even some changes that ISO requi requested, so it was it is late, in fact. So okay. the expectation is that we publish at the end of this month. Okay, so let's wait maybe for that and to, to have it. Um, okay, did we finish with management responsibilities? I just want to say one thing on this note, because one of the problems that we have, on uh, particularly on the MDR and historically on the MDD, is related to how to approach risk acceptability and risk control, right? So there were some deviations on EN uh, uh, ISO 914 and 71 2020, and I won't talk about them because the most of them are crazy, but <laughs> uh, one of the deviations was that you have to uh, reduce your risk as low as possible, right? Yeah. So that's not exactly what 1471 mentioned. But again, the 1471 does not require anything. That's the, pro that, that's the point. So that's why we included this note saying that the policy for establishing the criteria can define the approaches to risk control. For example, reduce the risk as low as reasonably reflectable, which is the LR concept. Reduces the risk as low as reasonably achievable. This is a lot of concepts. There are several of this component, uh, tens of them. We also introduced this last one, copy, copy directly from the MDR to make, make it very clear that it, what the MDR says is acceptable. So we just risk as fast as possible without adversely affecting the benefit risk yeah, ratio. It's, it's exactly yeah. what we have on the on the MDR saying that uh, yeah, benefit risk is something you have really to look at uh, to yeah. check you are you are not yeah you are not breaching that uh, that uh, that ratio. So we did include this to make it more clear as possible. We cannot. Uh, there was no way that we could simply uh, require or oh, do that because it's international standards, not for Europe, yeah. right? But hopefully this make it clear that first, 1471 does not require any of this in particular. They require some scheme, but not any of this. So if you want to do it for Europe, you can simply de de define on your policy that your approach to risk control is reducing risk as far as possible without directly affecting the benefit risk ratio. This would comply with 1471 and with the MDR or IVDR. No, I think it's good. Um, okay, so I think it's clear now for my responsibilities. Competence of personnel, I saw that uh, they are changing uh, some kind of definition here. What does it mean? What are the changes here? Basically, we correct an error because the original edition did, did not use the correct words, the correct concepts on competence uh, that 1345 uses and that 1345 gets from 9, 1000, right? So the old, the old version said something, oh, oh, people have to, uh, persons have to be uh, com competent on doing their tasks and that's it or something like that. But the correct way to say that is they shall be competent and the basis should be education, training, skill, and experience. So it is matches what 1497, uh, 1345 has always required, which is the concept of competence. But does it change anything to people that are um, doing those uh, risk uh, management activities? Not exactly. What, what happens is that if you didn't have a competence requirement apply it that fulfilled 1345, meaning the year based on education, training, skill, and experience, you have to do it now. But what, what does it mean that uh, they have to prove something? Or what means competent? Is there some kind of uh, documents or some trainings to have? Or what means yeah, that? They have to re define the requirements for competence, and then they have to show how the requirements are fulfilled. So each, each company has to do that. It's not like it's a requirement by uh, the ISO. Each company has to define what is a competent for doing the job that to define those risks. Yeah, but they, they do have to do that because of 1345, which the, the, the okay. requirement is in 1345. And it says exactly basically the same thing with some different words, but the concept is the same. And what so the thing here is that we, we, we simply change it to reflect the correct terms and terminology and concepts for 2045. Okay, so it's really an alignment with 1345. So it's uh, it's great. So that uh, there is no kind of uh, uh, misunderstanding between both uh, both uh, standards. Okay, so let's go to next uh, risk management plan. 
Yeah, the plan has some changes, and I would uh, just try uh, again. I didn't put every change; I just put the main changes, yeah. and these are the main changes. So, in item D, when it reaches acceptability criteria, we put a note that says that the criteria is essential for the ultimate effectiveness of the risk management process. If for each risk management plan, the manufacturers need to require to establish a risk acceptability criteria, they're appropriate for that device. Why so we do that? Criteria. So uh, risk acceptable criteria. So it means something that we say we accept that, but we don't accept from this this uh, this threshold defense or limit. Yeah, in fact, this is a problem because uh, when you think about that, most people think about risk matrices. Okay. We really, this is it's a historical problem. Risk matrices does not serve for what people are doing. <laughs> we try to put some stuff there, mentioning it, but. We can solve all the problems in the world. But one part of the problem here, and not just say uh, it is straight, is the general problem with the standards. And it happens to other standards also, uh, is that uh, this standard is created for people with a specific background. For example, people that know risk management. Usually in the industry, in the past, they are related to uh, reliability engineering. So most of the people that work with reliability engineering in the past are now risk managers for some companies. They have this background on risk management. And unfortunately, and it will happen anyway, a lot of people that work with these standards do not have this background. So it makes it a little difficult for people to understand some of the concepts and make it easier to use some uh, templates or things like that. This is one example, for example. In particular, this note is related to the fact that you need to have a criteria for each device. Okay. There's no, there's no technical sense in if you have uh, the same criteria, for example, for all devices. And there's a lot of companies that do that. And that's so, why specifically why this node was created. Okay, now I think it's, it's clear now why, why we are doing that. Uh, so this note was not existing before. It's really something new, just to clarify uh, this aspect for the risk management plan. Yeah, and I just forgot to say, everything that is in red here, it's totally new. There was okay. not before, so this note is totally new. Okay, so um, I think anyway, there were some companies that were doing that for their products, but it's just to be more clear. Uh, that they have to do that, that they have to have some criteria specifically for their products. Uh, but um, yeah, mainly on all the, the many companies that I was working for or helping, uh, these criteria were defined and it's, uh, it's, it was clear for, for that. Uh, risk management plan, we are talking about risk management. We can talk about uh, design uh, or we can talk about production or we can talk about all the thing, any risk that is related to the product. So here it's really um, complete. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh. We just got we got we got over one thing because if you look at the title, the title changes also for two reasons. First, it is now in four instead of three because ISO forty nine seven one they didn't had they hadn't include what they call the references. So uh, we had to include this now because ISO has been uh, enforcing that. So I didn't treat. Item two is reference, normally reference, three is terminology, and then four is general requirement. This okay. number two we didn't have in the old standards, so we have okay. to totally okay, so. change the number. Also, we did well, we had a problem because uh, in the case of uh, the MDR, we had a lot of discussions with the, the, the HAS consultant, not sure if people know, but it does work like this. We have a, there's a HAS consultant that works with for the uh, European Commission, and he analyzed the standard to verify if they can be harmonized or not. And one of the comments that he made, which was right, is that the MDR mentions something called the risk management system. Yeah. And uh, 4971, although it is a system, we never mentioned that. So okay. uh, instead of putting risk management process here, which was before, we simply change it to system. Uh, that's the only thing that we could do. We could, that there was no other way we could do that. So, we so as we said, it's really the, the objective is really to harmonize really all the vocabulary and the wording we are using because it's clear that if we say something on one and we it's a different wording on the other, we always have questions that people are asking why it's different, what is the difference, what. Is, but at the end, it's exactly the same, the same meaning. So, oh, the, the, main, the main problem here is that there, there's no re regulation. Uh, 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 besides the MDR that calls for a risk management system. 
this is the correct term, in my opinion, in the opinion of the other experts, but the regulators do not use this. And now okay. that we are using, hopefully others will use it. Okay, so great. Um, something else here? Or? Yeah, this, the, the E part is important because it's uh, another problem of the, the concepts. Uh, you usually cannot have uh, a method to evaluate the overall residual risk, including the criteria for overall residual risk, uh, as the same of the device. So the overall residual risk is related to the general risk of the device. It's not for individual risks. So the risk acceptability criteria is created for individual risks. That's how it works. But then you have to have a separate criteria that is the overall residual risk criteria to verify all the risks together, let's say. Something like that. So individual risk is one risk, uh, 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 accumulation of different risk for products. So each one has its individual risk, but here we are talking about the, the full risk for the full device with all the risks that we identified. Yeah, and there are several, several approaches on how to do that. We prefer not to include any, obviously, right? But the way you need it to make it clear that you have to have a method including a specific criteria for the overall residual risk. This will have a lot of impact because most manufacturers do not do that this way. Okay, that's great. Um, okay, next one. Yeah, the next one, the, the F, uh, F part, really, the, the note is just a comment on the previous one, but the, the, the F is just to make it clear, uh, uh, there was a requirement for activities for verification or very general way, and people were not very very clear on what it was mentioned. We did mention the two steps of verification there, the implementation and effectiveness of risk control measures. So we just make it clear what it is. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> more said, there is a lot of things that were that were unclear maybe on the previous version, and now we are just putting some notes to make them more clear for for people because I think there was a lot of questions asked about what does it mean that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most of the time people think that it's verification of design, for example, which is a common thing, right? So it it, it was confusing if you didn't know really know okay. what the standard was required. So. Okay, so let's go next now. Risk management file. Yeah, uh, the only thing that I think it's important to put here is that uh, as per our Brazilian request, we did include finally, not in the standard, but on uh, 24971, uh, specific a suggestion of a process on how to apply risk management for devices or component device components that were not designed to use it for T971. Basically, this is what we call in some other standards legacy products because, for example, we did create this concept in uh, the usability standard. And any uh, the problem with this process standards like usability and the software to 5204 is that they were created to be applied during design. If the design is already done, they they cannot be applied. That, that, that's the okay. thing. We have to apply. They do some stuff, but really, they, they sh should not be applied. We did recreate this these processes or alternate process for usability and for software, but we had in that for risk management. So we ended up uh, having an annex right now in for twenty four nine seven one that shows how we can begin complying. Uh, 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 a 14971 compliant risk management file and process for a device which you did not that before. So as we said, uh, this uh, ISO TR 249971 will be issued normally by end of this month or mm -hmm. beginning of next month. Uh, mm -hmm. So then we can see that there and it can help you then to define uh, those, um, those information for products that were not following the ISO 14971. Yeah. Okay, next one, intended use and reasonably foreseeable issue, uh, mis misuse, sorry. It's a very difficult term to, yeah. to, to say and simply impossible to understand what it is, in fact. Okay. My suggestion, since the beginning of my participation, this group, some, uh, I'm getting old, some 12 or 13 years ago, is just forget about reasonably foreseeable misuse because people do not understand them. 
even we do not understand them most of the time. So uh, I would prefer it was removed, but there were some reasons to keep it there. So it is still there. The main point is we separate it's 5.1 in 5.2 and 5. Point whatever the tree, the, the next slide. So it's separated now. So now we have the intended use here. And the thing is, the intended use obviously is related to other documents. We did, for example, in this case, mention that intended use should take into account information uh, placed on the usability standard on 602.366-1. Uh, so I mentioned that it should be uh, taken in consideration in technical medical indication, patient population, part of the, of the body or type of tissue, user profile, user environment, information principle. You can see this in 602.366-1. Okay, so... Um so um, I think um, this is, um, I think, interesting in terms of um, uh, information. But when you are saying reasonably foreseeable misuse, that we should not, yeah, it's not really understandable. Um, is it linked to, for example, um, some off-label use of products or something yeah. like that? No, I would prefer we don't go into that because the last time we got into that in our discussion, we create a flow chart, a big flow chart, uh, uh, discussed that for two days and just said, oh, the flow, let's describe the flow chart. Okay, <laughs> so great. And so forget that. I don't want to, but the thing is, it's a very, very, very difficult to understand, to teach, and to say concept. What we, what, what we just have is, if you look at that, we, we, we took the manufacturer shall document reasonable for some use, and there are some discussions on reasonable for some use, include one trying an explanation in 24971. My, my but, fear of this, yeah, if it, fear of this is, is in case of an audit, uh, when the auditor will have some interpretation of that when the company does not have the same interpretation and it starts to be a kind of a chaos because uh, are we compliant or not compliant can be also a big, big issue here. That's that's the reason I always ask it for it to be removed. There was that it's impossible to have people all understand the concept because it's a very, very, very difficult concept, unfortunately. Okay, so, so yeah, it would be maybe challenging for some of the auditors here that um, will maybe get some questions from the auditors uh, so some from the audience yeah, that gets a question from the auditor. So yeah, I, I, do, I do have a suggestion then, if anyway, right? Okay, you can look at the explanation that we created in 48, 24, and 71. However, the concept of regional foster misuse is used has been used for decades in consumer products. So there's a lot more of information in documents related to consumer products. Books, okay and things like that. So I would suggest people take a look up, look for other documents outside the medical device field to better understand reasonable for stimulus use. The main problem is you have to take care to not confuse the, the reason for stimulus use with use error or the misuse that we, dis we discussed in 62-66-1. And it's yeah. very confusing. Okay. So yeah, people don't be confused by that. Okay, next one, uh, identification of characteristics related to safety. Uh, this, this is a real problem, in fact, because if you look at the requirement, I didn't put it here, but if you look at the requirement, you have to identify the characteristics related to safety, right? This was original on XC in the standard, and uh, an XC had this list of questions. Uh, we put those list of questions in 24971. Okay. So, what, so what the problem is, is you really cannot fulfill this requirement if you don't get 14.24.971 and get those loops there. Okay. This is the decision we have to make, which was really, I didn't agree with that, but we ended up doing that. So for, because of this requirement on identification of characteristics related to safety, really you have to use 24.971. You cannot use that to comply with uh, 14 and 71. So it's really, really a problem. So it, you need, uh, it means that people have to buy the ISO 14971 plus the ISO TR 24971 to be really having full picture of what they have to do here. Yeah, because the list of questions that I use it are there now. Okay. 
So you know, the is very simple. Just say identify the characteristics based on questions and something like that. So you cannot in practice. You, you could do it without having twenty four nine seven one, but really in practice, people won't do that. So okay. And okay, just make sure it was not our intention to sell more standards, right? So it was some decision that we had to make, unfortunately. Good. And about the next note? Yeah, this next note, just make it clear that you need a lot of implementations that I see people just respond generally to those questions and then they just don't do anything with that. So they just put a into, into uh, uh, the table and forget about it. Uh, that is the problem. Those characteristics have to be used on the process. So they are a basis for a lot of all the other steps you do in the process. So uh, that's why we put note one here, in fact. Uh, okay. uh, note two, in fact, is just, and note two, in, uh, it's another thing that I think it's more confusing than anything, but it's just to mention that some characteristics may be called essential performance. For example, that's what we call some part of the performance related to risk in 60601. However, essential performance is really not understood by everyone. It's a really confusing concept. So I, I thought that we should not even put this note here because it creates more confusion than help. But anyway, it's there. Okay, great. So yeah, I hope it's uh, it's helping um, the audience. So yeah, don't hesitate also if you are listening to that, uh, if you have some questions, so to put that on the comments. And I will, uh, I will, uh, I will ask, um, I will ask uh, Marcelo about it. Okay, next one, uh, 5.4, identification of hazard and hazard use situations. Yeah, the, the first thing is we forgot the hazard situation when we, we revised the standard in the past, so we just put it here now, which is correct thing. The other, the other, the other parts are really not, really not the changes, but just was a clarification. It changed the the. the the text for that was before to identify and document just to make it more clear and this here we put it has to be based they, they, this uh, this uh, pro, this step has to be based on intended use reasonable for is use and the characteristics so this links everything together so people right now they cannot say that they're doing those things first and then do not use that before it just has to be clear the flow of the requirements okay uh, the other comments are just really comments that just say just uh, things to clear the language. Just say for each identified hazard, the manufacturer shall consider the reasonable for serious sequence of or combination of events and shall identify and document the resulting hazard situation. This, in fact, I don't agree technically because really we should always have required that the sequence of combinations of events be uh, also. Uh, recorded and oh, identified and recorded. But the thing is, it has always been like this, and then we kept as it is. We, 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 we need to consider the sequence of events or combination of events, but you only need to record, to identify, and document the result in other situations. However, this really creates a problem in practice because to control his risks, you have to control the sequence of events and combination of events. So this is the problem that I mentioned that I'm not very keen about. So uh, in terms of risk management, it's also to say that it's not just a, a one-time job. It's, a, as you mentioned, it's life cycle management. So each time something is changing, you have to reevaluate your risk. So it's something that is going through the whole life of the products and also through the whole supply chain of, of the product, so from, from beginning to the end. It is, but the, the, this this thing here is not related to that. This, this here is only related to what you have to record to comply with the standards. So you don't have to document the sequence of events or the combination of events. You have to document only the reserve situation. Okay. What I'm saying is that from a technical standpoint, uh, you can show risks by changing or by controlling things in the sequence of events or the combination of events. There's no other way to control risk, in fact. So even if you don't record that on document, then you need to use them. So there's a little of a mismatch between what you technically do and what the standards does require to be compliant with it. Okay, that's no, good. Um, what what, what you said is no the one that says the sequence of events can be initiated in any phase of yep. the medical device life cycle. We just put it that to make it very clear. Okay. Next. 
Yeah, the, uh, just just go back one. The third note is just to make clear. Yeah, the oh. third note is just to make clear that uh, uh, again, people sometimes are confused, but a single hazard it can lead to different hazard situations, right? Not only one, and people uh, are still confused because of that. This was a change in 2007 version, so people are still confused about the cause. But the thing is, you have one hazard; they can have several thousands, whatever. Hazard situation, not only one directly. So um, when when I'm looking at that, so um, I'm I'm thinking when I'm looking at that, I'm thinking about the FMEA uh, process, how we are looking at the different uh, issues plus the hazard plus uh, uh, the consequence. So um, here we are saying we have to do that, but they are not saying a specific method to do it. It's, you have to do it, but there is no specific method. There's no method to do risk management. That's another another misconception. FMEA is not a risk management method, yeah. although we call sometimes they're called that. They are hazard evaluation methods. They work with failures. So you can use FMEA or any method to create information that you need to input in your risk management process. But no, there's no known technique and most of them are the hazard identification or failure identification techniques that has all the steps of 14 and 7 for one simply because they are not risk management techniques. Yeah. So it's another very, very common misconception. Yeah, yeah, it's a misconception, but it's also something that uh, auditors are looking when they are trying to find this. And it's sometimes, um, maybe it could be confusing to them to receive another method than this one or another way to present the risk than this one. This can be a bit confusing to them. But yeah, there is no method defined. So you can choose which method you have as soon as you reach this objective that is mentioned here on the ISO. Yeah, and on the case of the author, there's a small problem here. That's the same as I mentioned in general, that the authors usually, unfortunately, they're not risk management experts. So they just look at the standard and try to figure out what there is without the background. So it's very difficult. So. Yeah. Unfortunately, unfortunately, and that's what I tried to mention, this standard has not created any standard. And I think this is the basic thing. I think I mentioned this in the past on the other on the other discussion. A standard is not created to teach anything. It is basically, it's created by a, a, a group of experts for a group of experts. So if you're an expert, you just say, oh, these are the basic consensus requirements. How to comply with them, the standards will not say. You have to know all the background information for that. Unfortunately, and I understand why, but again, it's a problem. Manufacturers, even auditors, they don't have this view. So sometimes, most of the time, they just say, oh, read the standard and do whatever. So without having this background. So this is what usually makes these discussions very different, difficult. Not the auditor or the manufacturer itself, but the lack of a common background in understanding the concepts. Because really, if you know this concept, you even do not need a standard, in fact. Okay, great. So I hope yeah, this will be helpful for some manufacturers uh, if they have some questions from auditors regarding to that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, next one, risk evaluation. Yeah, uh, this is a pro another problem. Uh, the, 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 all the, the really the, the the requirements on risk evaluation in the past was really wrong with the way they were written, because uh, when you evaluate risk, you should estimate the risk and use it to determine if the risk is acceptable or not using the criteria. The idea is very simple, but if you look at what was written before, it didn't say that. Really, it said something to totally different. <laughs> we just correctly all the all all the texts that say, well, for each identified hazard situation, you sh you shall evaluate the estimated risk and this estimate if risk is upset or not. This is the focus on risk evaluation, not what was written before. Most of the time, people did something like that, so I don't think it would be a very very much impact but the thing is if you strictly follow it follow what was written before you didn't do that um, okay well, and here we are talking also about so risk acceptability or not acceptable it says also that if a risk is acceptable and that then you have nothing to do if i can say uh, it's fine it's mm -hmm. acceptable but it should be treated um, as a residual risk in the mdr we are talking a lot about um, about risk, but also we have to evaluate for in terms of uh, of post marketing surveillance and uh, things all the residual risk. Is mm -hmm. it the same 
competition between the MDR and this one about residual risk because we have to inform the users about the residual risks uh, on the on the IFU or on the on the labels. So is it the same interpretation here? Yeah, in fact, the MDR it corrected some of the problems the MDD had, including those crazy deviations that were created for EM. Basically, the MDR really is totally aligning with forty nine seven one now. There okay. is one or two points of discussion. They're, they're not exactly written in the same way. And the lawyers will probably have a good deal of time discussing that. But 98, 99% of the MDR are using the ISO 4971 concept now. Okay, because here I have a question from uh, Robert Van Boxtel. So, Robert, thank you. Uh, do you think that the sentence with uh, if the risk is acceptable, will be causing a discussion toward MDR. Yeah, and that's one of the things because uh, it can had had a problem because the MDR says some things related to risk acceptability. For example, uh, you have to define. Uh, uh, you always have to. Uh, search for possibilities, even if the risk acceptable. But the thing is, uh, uh, again, uh, besides those small things, most of the time the MDR is doing exactly what 14971 requires. The main problem is that is still some of those things that the MDR says are not really 100% technically correct. So uh, it will create some problems. I'm pretty sure that some discussions will occur. But the thing is, when in the, when in the past, if the 14971 and MDD, there would be 100 discussions, this now will have problem B, have two or three or four, or whatever, a small minimum. Okay. So I hope this answers the question of, uh, of Robert. Uh, thank you for that. Um, something else here on the risk evaluation? I think we have covered everything. No, no problem. Uh, uh, just a second, Munir. Just a no second. problem. Wait. Oh, this is the live. <laughs> My son is just joining the conversation. Good. Um, so let's uh, go next. Risk control. Yeah. Well, this is another thing that I'm not fond of because uh, there is a there is. Uh, some misconceptions here, and the thing is, I think we furthered it. In practice, we created here and manufacture because the MDR says that inherit to safety design and manufacture, so we just put it there, right? But the main problem is that really the way the way uh, risk management works, in particular for TN seven one, is focused on product risk management, not, not process risk management. So this manufacture here. And the manufacturing process in on B is are very very confusing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, the the the, A, the part on A will make it very clear that it's like the MDR. And again, okay. it will, should 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 not have those conversations that the discussion that Robert mentioned. So it would create more conversations because now it's really like the MDR. Okay. Um. Relevant standards should be applied as part of the risk control option analysis. Um, what does it mean here? It means as a reminder that most of the standards, uh, product standards, really are the, the, the fine requirements for product risks. So you should, it's not a show because we cannot force it, but well, in fact, it should be a show, but we cannot say the show, right? But you really need to consider the standards as part of the risk control option analysis because they do have uh, risk control there. So that's just yeah. a reminder that people sometimes forget to look at that. Okay, because I thought that this one was already on the previous version. So that's why when I see that in red, I thought, I, for me, it was obvious that we are doing that in the, uh, re regarding the previous version, but yeah. No, um, Senator mentioned the policy, in fact. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about benefit risk analysis? Yeah, this is really just a chat, I'd say, cosmetic change that we did because most regulators noted that we always say in the past risk benefit analysis, but we are not looking for risks, we want the benefits, right? So if you yeah. say 
benefit analysis does not give a good idea on the term that we want. Yeah, so, I was, I was, yeah. I was, I was, I have always difficulties on this one with some of the customers uh, to define mm -hmm. what is how to analyze benefit risk. Um, we have made also, uh, and Robert Van Boxel is here, so we have made also an episode uh, for the podcast on, with Robert about also talking a bit about the risk benefit analysis because uh, there are some products that are really low risk uh, that um, that um, it's difficult to define um, benefit risk, if I can say, because it's a low risk product. So we have, yeah, in two weeks, so uh, not this week, but next week, we'll have an episode with Robert Van Boxtel uh, sharing more information about uh, benefit risk analysis for low risk devices. So uh, if yeah. it can help, I had a lot of questions from people asking me, uh, my device is low risk. Um, so how can I define that I have enough? Uh, clinical data, enough uh, information to say that it's uh, it's uh, it's it's fine. So yeah, so um, we will have that in two weeks. Okay, next benefit risk guys again. Okay, is there some yeah, changes? This again is the main, is one of the main changes that we have because we we just put the, the benefits here, right? And we do have now a benefit the, the definition the standard, which was is not exactly the same as the MDR or the other ones, but it's one that we in the end, consensus with us being the best definition for this this revision. We can always change that in the next, if that's the case. Uh, another thing that we put here is that if the evidence does not support the conclusion of the benefit outweigh the risks, then the manufacturer may consider, for example, modifying the device or the intended use. So it's just to make it clear what you need to do, because in previous text, it's not very clear what things need to be done. Um. So let's clarify this one. If uh, there is no evidence to support that the benefits outweigh the risk, uh, the residual risk, then the manufacturer may consider modifying the medical device or its intended use. So we keep the same device. We just say it will do something differently or less than what we are really expecting him to do. It's, it's that. And that's, that's the point. And that's what you asked exactly what is my concern because this may create a confusion like that. It's, okay. not, it's not exactly like that. The thing is, you may have support and evidence. Oh, one very clear example. So your device had three types of intended use. Okay? okay. This it was, it was designed for three types of intended use. Intended, not, not intended use. It would have one intended use, but in medical indications, for example, let's say. Okay? Three types of uh, indications. So you have evidence that for two of them, the benefit outweighs the risk. But okay. for one of them, you don't. What you can do, you can remove that that you don't. Okay. So you would have the device doing that in the market, but you still have the two other ones that you have evidence for. So uh, it's, it's about also claims. So you, you will not claim something that the device is not really able to do or uh, where the risk is really higher than the benefit then. It's just what... And yeah, it's saying that also. Not able to do, but the thing also, the main problem here is that you do not have evidence to support that the benefit for that application outweigh the risk. So you cannot uh, claim that application. Okay. So yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's. Uh, I think it's something important for people to to understand with, uh, with this. And we said that this is aligned with MDR related to benefit risk analysis. Yes. Good. MDR, in fact, does not does not go that deeper in some of the things they they do require that you have a risk a benefit risk analysis. But yeah. the text of the MDR itself itself does not go deeper on that. What you see that we have right now in the Europe is the, the annexes of MedDev for clinical evaluation. Then do go a little more deeper on how to do a benefit risk analysis. So uh, it's, there's no problem in that. Okay. okay good. And then again, just a reminder, and that's what, in fact, that's why we created this. It's, it's the just common sense in some way, right? So if you cannot prove something, you cannot claim something. But yeah. if you can prove what you can, you, you, you claim what you prove. That's what is written here, in fact, with some other words, but that's exactly what is written here. Okay, it's clear now. Good. Next, uh, evaluation of overall residual risk. Again, residual risk, again, um, evaluation. So what is changing here? And then uh, the main change here is that 
First, you have to evaluate the variables that you risk, taking into consideration the contributions in relation to the benefits. This was not here before. Okay. Right. So this, this I think, is the main change that we have for the standard. And if you would say the technical change, this is the main change we have for the standard. So we are requiring that you evaluate the other hours of the risk against the benefit. In fact, that's what the MDR requires, what the FDA requires, what whatever regulation, all regulations of the world require. It was not like this in the past. Okay, and here, if it's judged, if the residual risk is just acceptable, uh, we shall inform the users, which is also what is mentioned on the MDR um, mm -hmm. uh, for the for that. And mentioning it's mainly information through the um, the inform instruction for use or this kind of thing to say inside. Here are the residual risk, which was not a requirement before. If I if I think it was a requirement before, but not here. The thing the th the thing is, uh, we also changed it here a little because originally. And again, what has more sense? We did uh, suggest that the manufacturer evaluate which residual risks to declare. Okay. But because of the MDR, and this was again a lot of discussions, because I don't think this is 100% technically correct, but uh, it makes sense in the end to, to have it. So we, we are requiring right now that residual risks are uh, uh, disclosed. What we did in practice to correct this problem, general problem, is to put a significant there. Okay, yeah, so that significant is exactly. Um, mm -hmm. What, and here uh, at the bottom here, we are talking about when the residual risk is not judged acceptable, we have, we can also put some more additional risk control measures, or as we said before, remove that uh, intended use or, uh, from, or uh, modifying the device. So um, we, we know that it's not acceptable, but we are putting some control and we are proving that those controls are making the product safer, correct? Not exactly. And that's, that, that's the problem with this part. This is a higher, a higher level overview of risk. That's why it's over risk. The thing is, if you go back on what we said before, if you have, have an acceptable uh, individual risk, the yep. way the standard is written, you simply cannot have the device in the market, even if the overall the risk says whatever. But the thing is, if the overall residual risk is even not acceptable, it may be the case that some more controls on the individual level may, in the end, uh, create a device that, if you again perform after you have after you have you, you include any new control, you have to reevaluate the overall residual risk. But so, if it, it may be the case. That if you create some controls, additional controls for individual risks, you may conclude the other overall turns to be acceptable now. This is not something that will happen all the time, but again, this can happen. So that's why you okay. can. No, no, I think I understand that now. So it's really that you are making your evaluation, you find that it's not acceptable, then you are putting in place some actions to reduce again this risk by uh, by having some risk control measures, which then you reevaluate the risk and you find maybe then after that that it's acceptable again. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, risk management review. Uh, this is something that, again, creates more confusion than they should. I also suggested that we just remove that. But <laughs> at the end, what we did, and it did, maybe it will solve some problems, that uh, this is a review. This is not, the, the, the other term was a little more confusing. But the thing is, this is a review of the process and in practices, we, we are reviewing the execution of the plan. Okay. So uh, this is basically, uh, let's say, simple document. I'm saying that because it, it was the risk management report before, right? In the, in the 2003 version, the risk management report was confused with the risk management file. A lot of people just put everything in the risk management report and this created a problem. We correct the, this on the risk management report requirement in 2007, but it was not enough. A lot of people was thinking that the report, the risk management report should have everything. Uh, and also the report itself is not really the best way to do that because you can do more than one risk management review, right? So we have the risk management plan and then we are reviewing if the plan was well executed. Exactly. That, that's okay. what the 
the, the, that's what what we call the report was. But then we can do that for a review to make it more clear that you can also do that more than once because you can change the risk management place throughout the life cycle. So you can have more reviews if you want to. Okay, um, I just have here a question about from Diana Rosentul. Um, so Marcello mentioned that the standard is not a guide for people who are not experts, and that's not a didactical document. In the case that someone wants to learn more about risk management, which document or book he recommends? Do you have some yes. library? <laughs> this is a very good comment. As I mentioned, and again, that is not a criticism, a criticism to people in general, just the reality in fact, right? No standard is created to teach any to teach anything. That's my my from my experience. That the main problem people have with understanding standards because they are written for some specific target audience. Not not all the time they are clear with which the audience is, but they are really written for an audience, and there there's an expectation that the audience has some backgrounds on the matter, and sometimes it doesn't happen. So, and that's what I'm saying. That's a, criti a criticism in itself, but just a comment that this is a reality. The standards are not cre uh, like regulations. The standards are not created to teach a subject. They are created to have a consensus on expectations on the field. Right. So if you want to look at risk management, I would suggest that you look at several other risk management books. Uh, I may even send some uh, to Munir afterwards. Yeah. Uh, but my suggestion would be don't look at medical device risk management books. I don't think there is any for my I think I know all of the books on medical devices, including the risk management. There are there are some that I can find on the internet, the links. There are at least some three or four that I don't have or don't have seen, but most of the books I know, all of the recent ones, they always have some problems because most of them focus on FMEAs, focus on tools instead of risk management. It seems to me that people have a lot of different misconceptions about that, even in those books. So what I have always done, and I did that when I began working with risk management, is look at the books for real books on risk management for things in general and that's what you should take a look i can send some links and suggestions afterward and money you can send to the people to read yeah so uh, i will have the replay of this video um on my youtube channel next week on tuesday um mm -hmm. so i will put the on the show notes so please send, send me the links and i will put that on the show notes so people can uh, can go directly to that and you can also go and uh, get the 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 download of this uh, this presentation there also. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I hope Diana this helps you and uh, yeah by Tuesday you will have all the um, all the books or all the references that uh, that maybe can help you for that. Next one, production and post production activities. This was the clause that changed the most in fact because yeah. the way it was it was a good clause but really it lacked a lot of things. Uh, I won't discuss in detail everything. I even didn't put it here because it would take too much time. But the thing is, we did change in some important ways. Thing first, we included the word actively here, uh, and uh, again, uh, it, this this may be a problem because actively has more than one meaning. But the main idea here is that you have to go after the information instead of waiting for that, right? We also put that the manufacturer should consider the appropriate methods for collection and processing of information. So uh, this really ties with the, uh, although it does not say, it, you know, it does tie with the, the new standard, the new technical report that we're creating on post-market surveillance on TC210, it will be published this year, hopefully. But it, we do not say anything about methods here, but there are some comments on, on 27, 24 and 71, but it also ties with post, uh, PMS activities in general. So um, there is, I think, some other things here. Yeah, and that's what I didn't go into, really go into detail because there's a lot of things here. So we changed the whole uh, uh, tent in separate, for example, the first part was general, and then we put the actions, in the, the, the activities. First, you have to collect information, then you have to review the information, then you have to decide which actions you have to do. And you will have actions concerning the medical device in itself, 
or actions concerned the risk management process in general. And okay. inside each of them, there are several other things, several other tags that are new. But again, it's too much information to discuss here. No problem. Um, just before to go to this one, uh, let's come back. I have a question from Nassima Dauman. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a question, please. How can the standard ISO 4971 be applied by uh, an importer or distributor? It's a very, very good question because the the answer, the, 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 cor the correct, probably the correct answer is that an importer and the distributor cannot really apply 14.971 in full because 14.971 has been created to be applied by the manufacturer. Like, like when I say manufacturer, I mean the legal manufacturer, the guy that owns the project, the device design, right? So what usually, uh, and this I have been saying a lot in the past in forums on the internet, what a quarter of distribution distributor have to do uh, to help the application of 14971 by, by the designer is to, for example, uh, identify the risks on the steps they are doing, for example, and the process they are doing. But the thing is, uh, as you are not, do not have the design information, including information such as the risk acceptability criteria, there's no way you can apply in full the, 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 the standard. So as we said, yeah, you have the whole supply chain and there is just the end of the supply chain, for example, for distributors, but it's a collaboration, I think, with the manufacturer where they have to work together to define the risk that can happen. If, for example, you have to have a better box uh, to share the products to make it more safe and that during the transportation it's not damaged. So I think it's really a collaboration between manufacturer yeah. and distributor, but you cannot really apply it by yourself and say, and say that. Unless you, I suppose, you create some kind of risk related to your part of the transportation and you give that to the manufacturer, but it's really the manufacturer who has to define yeah. all and this. And no, never will do that, but this creates another problem because if you create the risk, whatever file plan, for example, your acceptability criteria won't be the same as the manufacturer have for the device. So this creates more problems than solves problems. Yeah, it's true. So yeah, I think I think yeah, the answer is really to work with the manufacturer and uh, to align with them in terms of the product. But I suppose as distributors do have a lot of uh, manufacturers that are sending products to them, it will be also a big workload for them to 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 put that in place. Uh, but it other, comes from the manufacturer; it's not coming from the distributor. So on the other hand, just to make it clear, for ten seven one is not does not although the standard itself is for medical device, really it just get you know, just use the basic premise of, of the medical device field. So ninety percent of the standard, besides this very specific medical device stuff, it can be used because it's really the same as for example ISO uh, thirty one thousand, which is a generic risk management standard. They are basically the same. So we can use the concepts if you want. But the thing is, if you think about applying fully 14 and 71, they were not created to anyone besides the manufacturer, which has the design and the responsibility with the device. Yeah, I agree with you. OK, so I hope it answers uh, your question, Nasima. Um, next, so we are at the end now of the presentation. What can we say to people here? Yes, yeah, so two things that I wanted to mention is that we have, as you mentioned, 24971 being published hopefully at the end of this month, right? And we, well, there was a problem in our last meeting in London, and uh, the ISOTC to attend what group one would be dormant for the next few years because there's no action item now. However, we will need to create one because if not, we're going to be disbanded. <laughs> so uh, ISO is enforced in some rules that, that they have been uh, they exist for decades but they never enforce it now they are enforcing it so the working groups have to be uh, an active work item or be disbanded so to key and those groups are difficult in particular our groups are difficult to, to, to create and go back so we'll probably have some work items related to 1471 or risk management in some part created in the future. We still didn't discuss that, but we need to do, we have to do that because of this thing on the background. Okay, so great. I think it's a great information for people. Um, um, so if you have questions, 
still questions, so let us know now. Um, anyway, you can still contact uh, Marcelo Antunes. So here is the email and also connect with him on LinkedIn. Um, so Marcelo, I think yeah, people can reach out to you directly and then they can uh, to ask you a question related to, uh, to the ISO or also if they have any a thing to do related to uh, some support, some consulting, consulting support as you are working for SQR Consulting. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that thing that is uh, that is great. Uh, as I've said, um, this will be a replay. Will be running on uh, Tuesday. Uh, so I will compile everything, compile all the data that uh, we made today, and try to have um, that on the show notes, so that uh, yeah, it can help you uh, help you a lot. If you have any other requirements uh, for LinkedIn Live, so let me know also. Uh, I can try to contact some people also to make some LinkedIn Live. Uh, as I've said, what is interesting with this formula is the fact that you it's interactive, so we can try to answer the question that you are, uh, the hot topics that you have uh, yourself, so which uh, which can help, I hope, a lot of, of you. Uh, so if you have any other topics, so let me know. You can send me an email at info at uh, easymedicaldevice.com, so info at easymedicaldevice.com, and I can try to uh, to help you uh, or to, to collect all the topics and to find the right SME. And maybe there is another standard that uh, that Marcelo can help us, or also uh, some other topics that he can come and, and help us with. Marcelo, something else for the audience? No, I think that's that. I would thank you again, Monir, for the invite, and thank the audience for the participation and questions. And I can, again, answer any question if you want afterwards. Thank you. No problem. So, yeah, if you have more questions, please contact directly um, Marcelo Antunes uh, from SQR Consulting. So, thank you, everybody, and uh, have a nice weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye.